So um, welcome everybody. Um, it is wonderful to have you all here today. Um, my name is Jessica. Um, I am the front of house um, and market marketing supervisor here at Benjamin Franklin House in London. Um, and um, I will be hosting um, our talk with Nancy Rubin Stewart. Um, I am speaking from Benjamin Franklin House, um, and this is the only remaining home of Benjamin Franklin anywhere in the world. Um, and also, um, it was home of um, to two of Franklin's women, Margaret and Polly Stevenson, who um, Nancy so brilliant give, brilliantly gives a voice to in her writing. Um, the talk today will be recorded and uploaded onto our YouTube channel, um, so if anyone wants to watch it afterwards then um, you know where to find it, um, and also closed captioning is available for anyone who also needs that as well. Um, after Nancy's presentation there will be um, an opportunity for you to ask your own questions, um, so please do um, leave them in the Q&A function as we go along so that we can kind of get straight ahead and get, get into those um, once, once the talk is finished. Um, so um, now um, I will introduce our author, um, so Nancy Rubin Stewart, welcome. Um, Nancy is an award-winning author um, whose non-fiction book focuses mo mainly upon women and social history. Um, of course, this does um, include the focus of our chat today, Poor Richard's Women, which um, Deborah Reed Franklin and the other women behind the founding father. And this was published by Beacon Press in March 2022. But excitingly, it has just been re-released in a paperback in honour of this year's Women's History Month. And um, we are very lucky enough to have some copies here at the house. So if you are in London, do stop by um, because you can purchase your copy from our shop after the talk today. Um, but earlier books by Nancy include Defiant Brides, which was named by the Wall Street Journal as one of the best books on revolutionary era women, um, The Muse of the Revolution, and the best-selling American Empress. Um, Nancy's journalistic work has appeared in the New York Times, the Huffington Post, the Washington Post, the Baltimore Sun, the New England Quarterly, and also national magazines. Additionally, she is the executive director of the Cape Cod Writers' Center, so we are incredibly lucky to have Nancy um, with us today. So please, um, Nancy, over to you. Um, I'm gonna share my screen and get the presentation up and running. Um, but yes, I do hope everyone enjoys. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jessica. It's my pleasure to be here. I, um, I've heard about the Benjamin Franklin House for years and been seen it from the outside, uh, but never been in. So it's very exciting to me um, to be able to speak with you today. So uh, we all know about Ben Franklin. Um, we can go to the next slide. Uh, of course, that's the cover of the new book. Uh, it took me a while to get it, get it done. I have to say, I started 20 something years ago and had to put it away. Publishers weren't interested for a long time. We know about Ben. We know about him as the father of electricity. We know about his kite and his, his key. We know about him as the signer of the Declaration of Independence. We can go next slide, please. We can go to the next slide, please. Yeah, um, yeah, there we go. And we know about all these famous maxims that, that he uh, has in his Poor Richard's Almanac. Now, they're not all just with his, some of these were folk wisdom that he, his pithy pen changed into better, more words, um, but we know about them. And he always has the idea behind them that you have to be very cautious in life and you have to think about things and you can't just go for pleasure. Next slide, please. And of course, the most famous of early to bed, early to rise, makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. I love the second one, better slip with foot than tongue. Um, and finally, to eat to live, don't live to eat. Of course, if you look at portraits of Ben Franklin, you wonder certainly about the third one. But as a young man, uh, he was uh, thin and spry and a great swimmer and, and really an athlete wrestler. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, and of course, here in America, what else will we do for the, the person who's supposed to represent the idea of thrift if he's on our $100 bill? Okay, next slide, please. And he did love women, and he admits it. Even when he's a teenager, he's writing about women. He loved to take the voices of women and write in their voice. He wrote in, he was working for his brother as an apprentice, and he took on the name of Silence Duguid, a widow, and he opined and he made fun of all the Puritans in, in Boston. And he also wrote about women, of course. And in one of them, one of these letters was very funny. He writes about how uh, actually he defends prostitutes. And he says, they are wonderful, the economy of Boston. 
They make everybody happy. And they especially make happy the shoemakers because they wear out their shoes so long. I mean, he's 16. So you begin to see this is a person where his admiration of women stems way back. And he has always a winking view, always a jest uh, around them. Uh, he hated his brother after a while. His brother was treating him like a normal apprentice, not a, not a brother. And he finally left and he fled to Philadelphia. Um, first, next slide, please. And of course, while he was there, he roomed, he had, he finally got a job as a, another printer. Uh, he roomed with John Reed, who was a carpenter. And he, uh, and, and lo and behold, he had a daughter um, named Deborah. Now this portrait of Deborah is not until she's well into middle age. You can see she's attractive, reasonably not gorgeous. Of course, he thought gorgeous women were suspicious, <clears throat> at least his wives. <laughs> because he felt they would be surely cuckled, um, they would be cheating on their husbands. Anyway, he 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 proposed to Deborah while he lived there, and um, they were betrothed. And uh, yet, uh, um, they didn't get married. Then uh, there were several reasons. First of all, her father died suddenly. And her mother, who was a, uh, by then uh, Alvoli, that's where she learned her bookkeeping skills. <coughs> but Ben was also supposed to go to England uh, at the courtesy and payments uh, from uh, one of the assistant governors in Pennsylvania. Now, it turned out this governor was a slippery character. But anyway, they didn't know that at the time. And Mrs. Reed said they were too young to get married. They were both 18. Uh, wait until Ben came back and he'd established his printing business. So poor Deborah, there she was. She'd lost her father and her fiance within a period of just a few months. <clears throat> so Ben got to England. He loved London. Who doesn't? I love it. Everyone loves being there. Um, so interesting. And in, in the 18th century, for Ben, it was a ferment of intellectual activity and coffee shops and literary, you know, it was the golden age of liter liter literature. So uh, he he loved it. Uh, but he also probably at that time, he was, he had a friend he brought with him, he began to sort of, and he sort of an attitude towards women, he, he immediately made passes to his best friend's girlfriend, that didn't work out. But he also writes in his autobiography that he, he began to associate with quotes, low women, to satisfy his natural urges. <clears throat> of course, we don't know who or when, but most historians believe that was in London. In any case, he finally writes to Deborah only one letter, and it, he says he doesn't know when he'll be back. Now, Deborah's mother is and friends are horrified. This could be he might stay forever in England, and Deborah would be waiting for him. And Deborah was of marriageable age, so with great sort of pressure from her mother and her friends, she agreed to accept other suitors. And in 1725 August, she married a gentleman named John Rogers. John Rogers was also English, but um, as it turned out two months into the marriage, she discovered that he was already married. He had a wife in England. That was it for Deborah. <clears throat> she fled back to her mother. She wouldn't take his name. Of course, Mr. Rogers already had her dowry. So this was not good. And sure enough, um, he squandered the diary, di dowry. He uh, got into big trouble with, with his business. He um, fell into debt and eventually he fled to the West Indies. Now that left Deborah is a very strange situation. She's now 19. She's neither single nor married. Uh, in, in Philadelphia, in Pennsylvania, in the colony of, of of uh, in most North American colonies, you couldn't get a divorce. It was very, very rare. So she was sort of the odd young woman out with all her friends were getting married and having children. And she fell into despair. Uh, people said her personality changed. Instead of being outgoing and industrious and all of that, she, um, she became very depressed. Well, by the time Ben came back some 18 months later, he found Deborah a changed woman. He did start a new printing business eventually, um, and uh, it, but he, he didn't he didn't bother too much uh, flirting with Deborah. No, no, no. He courted other women, but none of the other fathers of those women wanted him because they thought printers made poor providers. 
kind of ironical because Ben becomes one of the wealthiest men in colonial America uh, later on. Anyway, finally in 1730, uh, he in this summer he went to when he he had his own printing business by then he went to Mrs. Reed and he said I really feel guilty about Deborah and she said yes and he said I, I feel it's my fault and she said yes but it's my fault too because I encouraged you to get married and so the next thing we know from Ben's autobiography is that all of a sudden all he writes and he has a way of saying important life events he just glosses over anything emotional so all he writes in his autobiography is. Uh, I took her to wife on September 1st, 1730. Well, they couldn't get married in a church. Deborah is neither single nor married. We don't know whether her, her husband is dead or alive. Uh, and there's a question of his debts. Is she going to be responsible? So basically, I took her to wife. What does that mean? Well, you know what that means. They moved in together. So it became a common law marriage and one that lasted for 43 years. Next slide, please. Uh, the historian's view of Deborah until rather recently was this was a dumb provincial woman who had no, nowhere near the brains that Franklin did. Nobody could understand why he married her. It was a mistake of youth. Um, yes, she was not intellectual. No, she was not well read, but women in colonial America really didn't go much beyond early years in school. Women were expected to be in the home and the hearth. It was hard enough in, in colonial America to, um, to get the laundry done, to get the house clean, to get the meals prepared, not to mention all the children the average woman would have. So um, that was the historical view, but a closer look at her letters indicates this was a very shrewd businesswoman, and we have a lot of proof for it. Ben um, has great respect for her, her, her business acumen. He fact, he says he was really lucky to have a wife who was so frugal. It was because of her, she proved a fortune to him. She was not only frugal, she was hardworking. So here's just a few examples. Um, now you see the, the writing is atrocious. Th these, by the way, are some of the best of her writing. It's all phonetic. So no wonder the earlier historians thought, boy, <laughs> this is a really stupid woman. Um, but you have to remember, as recent scholarship uh, has pointed out, that women in colonial America did not learn to spell. They did learn to read, but not to spell. So here she is sounding out her words. And I think what's interesting is in the next, the one says, my dear child, which is uh, the second entry, um, she, you can see the saleswoman sort of um, brain working in her, this little, little excerpt where she says, I, I inquired about Thomas Miller's houses. And she says that Amos Strudel bought them a third more than they're worth. Indeed, I wouldn't give half above what he has for them. So, you know, you see this already, this businesswoman um, mind that's going. And she was a great salesperson. Um, she took over his stationery shop and turned it into a bustling general store, uh, imported goods from the wharves and from the countryside. And one of the, one of the leading sort of women business people. Um, when, um, when Ben had to leave on a trip, she, he of all things made her power of attorney. That's just unheard of in America in the, in the 18th century for a colonial woman to have that kind of power, but that's how much he trusted her. So the beginning of the marriage seemed to go very well uh, until one day, and I need next slide on this one, please. One day, Ben comes home, and they're only married about six months, and he presents it with this, he's carrying a big blanket and inside of it is, is, is a squirgling, giggling baby, a gurgling baby. And he says, this is my son. His name is William. Well, Deborah is flabbergasted. Uh, he expects her to take care of this child. Well, who, who is the mother? I have to tell you, the historians have spent <laughs> many volumes trying to figure out who the mother is. We still don't know. Um, and Deborah did not want to take care of the child. I mean, she's all of 20 or 21, and here she is supposed to bring up somebody else's child. There are lots of theories about the mother. Um, I don't think it was a prostitute, because if it was, why would he claim the child? After all, other men were with that prostitute. So one of the scholars um, here in America, J. J. Leo LeMay, um, has posited a theory I believe in. He said that he thought that this was a woman of higher status than uh, a, a prostitute. 
um, but that she was probably married and her husband was at sea or traveling for many, many months, maybe a few years, and he suddenly was going to come home and, and she had this baby. And so he presented it to, to, to uh, Franklin to um, take, take care of it. Yes, Deborah does raise the child. And he's kind of a rough young man. Um, and uh, she, she only does it because, as one of her family um, recalls, she out of her great love for him. But uh, the next picture in the next slide, you'll see who he is. That's William Franklin. He becomes the uh, court appointed new, uh, governor of the colony of New Jersey. And as you probably know, he becomes a Tory later in life, much to the dismay of, um, of Franklin. Now, if we can go back two slides, please, uh, Deborah. Uh, one more, one more. Yeah, thank you. Um, now, Deborah um, and he worked very hard together for many years and um, Ben becomes the, um, he becomes the clerk of the assembly. He becomes the official printer for the colony of Pennsylvania. Um, he has buys uh, properties. He has paper mills in other colonies. He has little um, Poor Richard's Gazettes, uh, Poor Richard's, um, uh, yeah, Poor Richard's, um, all the almanacs in other places. Um, he's very, he becomes very wealthy in his 40s. Now, um, Deborah did, had another child uh, in 1732, Frankie or Francis. Unfortunately, and they love Francis. It was their their child together, their son, uh, and he he was filled with promise. Evidently, he was very smart. He was good looking. He was energetic. They even began having him tutored when he was two and a half years of age. I guess he was very smart. Uh, but meanwhile, smallpox is raging here in in the colonies, and Ben in his uh, Pennsylvania Gazette is always uh, warning people to get well. We will we'll say. Uh, protected, which meant a variolation. Now that wasn't an inoculation. We didn't have hypodermic needles, but you did scrape the, pul the pus from one person and put it into the other, the healthy person. And that would, they, most people survived that and then they were, were immune to smallpox. So Ben's always lecturing about this in the Pennsylvania, his newspaper, the Pennsylvania Gazette, but he can't inoculate or variolate his son. And his son is very ill. His little son is very ill with dysentery and he dies. So this is a sorrow that Deborah and, and, uh, and Ben share for many years. There's a portrait, a little portrait done of him when he was a child. He dies when he's just four years of age and they grieve over it. And the, that portrait, Deborah always displayed it for the rest of her life in a prominent place in her home. Uh, Deborah does not have another child for another seven years. Again, the rumor mill <laughs> claims, oh, they didn't love each other anymore. Um, ben, by the way, does later a population sort of uh, treatise in which he notes the increase in population in, in the colonies compared to the UK or then Britain. Uh, and most women in colonial America, married women had an average of eight children. But meanwhile, Deborah, seven years goes by, there are no more children, why? Well, the rumor mills say that, as I said, they don't like each other, but that's probably not true. Probably Deborah had a number of stillborns and miscarri miscarriages, at least that's my view anyway. She does finally have another child, Sally or Sarah, their one daughter in 1743. Um, well, Ben, I will not go through the whole history. We don't have the time, but he's very active um, as a civic leader. He starts... Um, he founds um, a, a lending library, a fire stations. Um, he uh, is an influential in the assembly and getting roads paved. He's looking for streetlight illumination. Uh, he starts the Junta, which is an intellectual group. He actually begins another, founds what becomes the University of Pennsylvania. He's, he's a civic leader. He's also somebody who's very upset with the Pens. The Pens are the proprietors of Pennsylvania colony. Unlike the other colonies, which all but what two others are royal colonies appointed by the crown and managed by the crown. And the Penns, who William Penn had come here from, the, from Britain to start sort of a free colony where anybody could come regardless of religion or culture or anything else. Uh, and he was very liberal, but his sons were not. And they had gone back to England and they lived the lives of aristocrats. 
and they were not willing to pay their taxes, especially for the defense of the frontier, which was the western part of Pennsylvania near the Ohio River Valley. So this becomes very difficult as uh, number one, the war, the European wars come here to, to the states and there are hostilities with the tribes and some of the tribes are pro the colonies and some are, are pro uh, uh, one of the, the French. And it's it's really very difficult. And Ben becomes a leader in in raising a, a, a civil militia that annoys, uh, aggravates, and irritates the Pens, who now consider him a dangerous man because he's so popular and he's defied their authority. So uh, that with that background, by we, by the time we get to the 1750s, uh, and we're now just beginning with the French and Indian war, things are getting worse and worse on that frontier. I mean, there were there were people who came and stormed from that frontier. The settlers were so upset with the, with the whole mess with the French and the and the Indian, the, the Native Americans, they become so upset that um, they uh, they actually come to Germantown, which is now a suburb or part of, of Philadelphia. It's frightening. So the Quaker Assembly in Pennsylvania now appoints Ben and they say, uh, you uh, you should be going to uh, England and talking to the Pens. But before we go on with that, I just want to come back to one of the rumors about Ben. One of the many rumors is that this man was uh, a ladies' man. All right. If you look on the internet, you'll see some silly things, including at least one that says he had twelve illegitimate children. It's just we don't know. I mean, it's nonsense. It's probably greatly exaggerated. But I want to move forward. So Jessica, if you can move this forward, I think it's three slides. Go beyond that. There we are. Okay. All right. So this is one little indication that might have fed into that rumor mill about Ben and his uh, promiscuity. Um, so he did write this letter. It was originally, you know, primly entitled Old Mistress's Apologue. But later, the historians have now changed it to advice to a friend on choosing a mistress. Now, he uh, you'll see if you read this, that he says that he sh that if you're not going to get married, well, I think that in all your love affairs, your amours, you should prefer old women to young one for mistresses. He doesn't mean an old woman. Old, <laughs> at least in colonial America, was 40. The average woman died at age 40. Uh, 42 uh, in, in this country. So what he means is an older woman. That is somebody probably in her late 30s as co compared to somebody who's 18 or 20 or 22. And there are eight reasons that are listed why it's better to have a mistress who's an older woman. Um, it, some of them are pretty graphic, um, but I'm going to give you the 21st century kind of snarky interpretation of them. And if you want to read more, you can find it in the book. Um, anyway, that older women are preferable to younger ones because they don't yell, they don't swell, and they're grateful as hell. So I'll just leave it at that. Everyone wonders, does why did Ben write this letter? Now, maybe it was just body, B-A-W-D-Y kind of conversation. I mean, there were, there were all this kind of you know, sort of risque writing that men read privately about women that was, it, maybe it was that. On the other hand, maybe he seemed to have pretty good knowledge about this. So what, what was he doing? Was this before he was married to Deborah with other women? I mean, we know he obviously fooled around. Um, uh, um, certainly William is, is proof among other things. Um, or was he having an affair with somebody when he was married to Deborah? We don't know. The historians don't know. But anyway, it's one more piece in in the the view that we have of of Franklin as somebody who loves women probably too much. Anyway, you can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So the assembly now. Um, uh, one more also that one more little affair was with Catherine Ray. Well, it, it was not consummated. He met her in Boston and he escorted her on her way back home to Rhode Island. And they did stay over at least a couple of nights in, uh, had to in, in inns. We don't know what happened there. We do know they had a wonderful love affair. Um, the letters are delightful. There's, there's many of them. Some of them they burned. Um, but I just want to reach, have you see this little scrap from one of them when when he didn't, he writes to her and, 
he didn't get all this, that he missed a letter from her and he writes, he promised to send me kisses in the wind. So we do know that he had propositioned her finally. <clears throat> she was all of 23 and he was 48. Yeah, a dangerous age for men, I guess. But anyway, um, he propositioned her. He said he was gonna teach her multiplication if she'd be willing. Multiplication being how one and one make three. But anyway, going on with this little excerpt, your favors come with the snowy fleeces, which are as pure as your virgin innocence, white as your lovely bosom and as cold. <clears throat> so when she rejected him, he got pretty upset about that. But they did remain friends and they did correspond for many years and she did eventually get married actually to the, to the be, became the man she married became the uh, governor of Rhode Island. Okay, we can go on to the next slide, please. So the assembly says to, to Ben, given all the problems that have gone on in the frontier and the taxes and the pens, you have to go to England, you have to go to London, you have to talk to the pens. If that doesn't work, you're gonna to have to go to the king and his assistants and get them to pay their taxes. Uh, so Ben announces this to Deborah that they're going to, to, uh, to go, have to go to London and Deborah refuses. Now, <laughs> since you're all involved with the Benjamin Franklin house, you know that Ben went himself bringing his own uh, son with him, William, 24 years of age, to study uh, at the Inns of Court uh, as an, as a, to become a barrister. But more importantly, Margaret Stevenson, um, I think the address was uh, 27 or 26 Craven Street at the time. It's changed several times, by the way. You probably know that. Um, but anyway, uh, she rent out rooms. She was a widow. Uh, she rent out rooms to travelers. And of course, she rented out rooms to Ben and, by the way, to his son, William. Uh, ben um, stayed there for uh, five years. He was only supposed to be there for a year. Things did not go well with the pens. He pleaded with them. He met with them. He exchanged letters. We have some of them and with some of his assistants and so on. Uh, it did not go well. And even when he finally did wrest a concession from them that they might pay taxes, they never really did. Uh, Deborah, meanwhile, we don't know why she didn't go. There are there are lots of questions. What we do know is that Ben's English friend and the printer, the publisher, uh, and he published, uh, I think it was Sam, uh, Samuel Johnson's um, work uh, uh, later. Anyway, William Strahan was quite alarmed uh, because he wrote to Deborah and he said, Ben is very popular here. Your husband is very popular here with the ladies. Um, and he's living with a very charming widow. Uh, I think you should come over here to protect your interests. That's how we put it. Uh, and Deborah, to his surprise, refused. Now, again, the historians have rushed in and given all kinds of reasons why Deborah didn't go. Oh, of course. First of all, she is, no, she's a very uh, ignorant provincial uh, woman who would never be able to compete or hold her head up high with the sophisticated and urbane uh, people of London with whom Ben would be uh, involved. Well, that's kind of a misogynist view. Um, the other theories um, about that, that she was afraid of, of crossing the ocean. She had come over from Birmingham, by the way, with her parents when he was, she was quite young. It must have been a terrible journey. This was in 1711. Uh, and perhaps the trauma of that journey uh, had frightened her. She just didn't want to go back on the sea. Now, I have a theory. I think that she had a certain place in a stature um, in Philadelphia. She was not only a shopkeeper, well-known, uh, she'd grown up there, of course. She had friends in high places. Um, she um, had worked as assistant postmistress uh, with Ben. Um, she was highly respected. She had many elite friends. There's letters about that. And I think that um, she, had, uh, she had a certain place. Uh, there's another reason too. <clears throat> Ben is forever trying to marry off Sally, their daughter, to William Strahan's son. And Deborah is horrified because arranged marriages weren't, uh, weren't accepted here in the colonies. 
<clears throat> perhaps they were at the time in England also, she didn't want Sally to marry somebody in, in London and then she would have to be back in Philadelphia. She adored her daughter and didn't want to be separated. In any case, she didn't go. So Ben remained there for five years, even though he was supposed to be there for a year. And poor Deborah, she's always pleading for him to come back. And Ben keeps making excuses and saying, you know, he can't, he has work, he has things. Uh, he does travel around uh, um, Great Britain, and he, he also goes to the continent, at least on two different occasions in those years. He finally comes back in 1763 after five years. Deborah is ecstatic. She is, she is sure that he's going to be there forever with her, and their marriage is going to resume. But indeed, Ben is writing to um, Margaret, rather secretly, by the way, and um, other friends and saying how much he misses England. He writes to Polly. If we could go to the next slide, that would be great. Polly, of course, uh, Mary Stevenson. Uh, this is probably her wedding picture. At least that's what historians think. And he loves Polly, uh, adopts her as sort of his daughter, sort of surrogate daughter. And he is forever teaching her and lots of warm, wonderful letters. She's a bright woman and she's always asking questions about scientific things. And he's always providing that information to her. Uh, by the way, he's much uh, more affectionate to her than he is to his own daughter back in, in, um, in, in Philadelphia. He keeps um, writing to his daughter, you know, go to church more, be more thrifty, uh, not really very encouraging and, and really keeping her as sort of a colonial woman as opposed to the more sophisticated treatment he gives to Polly. In any case, as I say, he gets back to America, to Philadelphia, and he's writing to everybody saying he, he, wants, to, he wants to go back. Deborah is horrified. And when she hears about he wants to go back, she, I, they must have had a big argument or maybe several. In any case, he finally agrees he's going to build them a house. William, their son, writes to actually uh, William Strahan about this and says that's supposed to placate Deborah and assure him that there, she, he's there to stay. Uh, but indeed, the, he, he half finishes the house. He also goes on postal tours. Um, he's not around that much. And then the assembly says once again, because now we're into the 1760s and the settlers, and there are raids, things are getting really bad in terms of what the upheavals that are happening from the frontier to uh, the rest of the colony of um, of Pennsylvania. And they say, you must go back and you must get this settled one way or the other. But meanwhile, as you know, the Americans have already begun to protest what they consider British oppression, the various acts that the British have imposed upon uh, uh, America to pay for uh, expenses uh, incurred in one of the earlier wars, several of the earlier wars. So there's a lot of mounting frustration and boycotts and protests and burnings and everything else. And pretty soon, well, Ben is, uh, he has to go to England. They just are depending on him to do something. So Deborah, again, refuses to go. Now, Ben, this time, becomes so angry, he says to her, and we know it from one of Deborah's letters, uh, you will only write to me about cheerful things and you will not complain. And so off he goes. And his relationship, again, with Margaret Stevenson and with the Craven Street townhouse and, and with Polly um, becomes more and more important. It really becomes what he calls his English family. And when um, Sally marries, and she marries an Englishman who unfortunately is a debtor, he's furious. I mean, he's considered the, the he's considered the master of thrift internationally. And she marries a debtor and he's furious with Deborah. Uh, but when Polly marries, he actually becomes, he, he steps in as her stepfather and he met, he, he's, he's there for the, for the wedding. And then when Sally has children and Polly has children, all he does is praise Polly's children. He becomes the godson to, to one of them at least. And um, you can imagine how Deborah felt. Yet he keeps saying he, he's going to come back. He'll come back on the spring ships. He'll come back on the packet ships in the fall. And but every single time he doesn't come back for various reasons. And Deborah, meanwhile, although she's proud of her grandson, grandchildren, she suffers a stroke 
uh, Ben sends her medical advice, um, but when everything, things go on for a while, and then Deborah um, becomes very ill, she stops writing. Meanwhile, Polly, uh, as I'm sure you know, had married to a very distinguished young physician um, uh, who did a lot of work, important work in blood work, um, uh, Dr. Hewson, uh, Polly has married him. She's now has two children and she's pregnant with a third. And while he has, by the way, Margaret and, and Ben move um, to another address across the street so that Polly, her children, her husband uh, can have the, the townhouse at, at 36 Craven, now 36 Craven Street. And he has sort of a, a medical amphitheater or or office or, or, or a place where he does anatomy on, on his research in the house. In any case, he contracts what we think was a disease from one of the cadavers and he dies. That leaves Polly with two children and she's about to have a third. Ben feels he cannot leave at that point. Deborah is getting more and more ill. <coughs> and suddenly, um, Deborah dies in um, 1774, December, but I have to add that Deborah dies alone, longing for Ben. I have to add that, that Ben has already been dismissed um, by the Privy Council because of some affairs involving the revolution, the American Revolution. And there is no historians, again, scratch their head. There's no seeming reason for him to stay there. One of the scholars um, says, you know, this is when Ben became an American because he was so upset with the what happened in the Privy Council in the cockpit, uh, where he is shamed because of his, quotes, part, inadvertent though it was, in the revolution. So there's no reason for him to stay. Nevertheless, he does, and Deborah dies alone in 1774. Ben does not come back for several months. Uh, William, their son, actually chastises Ben and says, you know, the one thing she wanted was to see you before she died. So there's some loyalty from, from um, William to Deborah at this point in time. In any case, Ben is only in America for a year. He actually comes back right after Lexington and Concord. He's there. He, he, he's involved with um, signing the Declaration of Independence and other, other activities. Uh, but he is now being sent um, on to France because the American Revolution is well underway and their Congress has no money. Uh, they're desperate for money and they're hoping that Ben, with all his diplomatic and negotiation skills, uh, can persuade the French um, to uh, support, help support the American Revolution. And so he does. Uh, and he does very well. He's successful ultimately. Uh, and he works very hard at it in his own way. Now, if you've read anything about John Adams, you know John Adams, who was, also became one of the eventual uh, ministers uh, for America. And uh, John Adams criticizes uh, Ben, and says he stays up late, he has involved with the ladies, they make tea for him, um, he hobnobs at salons, he um, is enjoying French food, he sleeps late in the morning, he doesn't do his papers early, everything is delayed. That's Adam's view, grumpy Adam's, prim New Englander view of, uh, but Ben had a reason. He was very diplomatic. He knew how to negotiate with people. He knew how to befriend them, which is what he did um, in France um, while he was there. Uh, but of course, Adams didn't see it that way. And next slide, please. Uh, I want to come back for a second. Now, this is interesting. Charles Wilson Peel, a famous painter, who later does a very distinguished portrait of Ben, happened to be an art student studying. He was American. He came to study in London. He roomed for a while in Mrs. Stevenson's home. And he, of course, knew Ben. He opened the door one day inadvertently, 1768. And in lo and behold, this is what he saw. And I want to go on to the next slide, please, because it's even more explicit. Who is this woman? <laughs> we don't know. So, um, again, the historians have rushed in with all kinds of, but to this day, we don't know who that woman was. Um, so we'll leave it at that. But that's one more, I guess, one more factor in the uh, in the rumor mill about Ben being this incredible, 
insatiable um, uh, lover of women. We can go on to the next slide, please. In France, while Ben was a very skillful negotiator and it did take a long time, he didn't, he, he certainly loved women and he made no bones about it. Uh, and he was soon introduced um, to this charming 33-year-old, uh, he's now in his 70s, 33-year-old famous musician. She favored the piano forte, over the harpsichord was actually one of the people who was an advocate for it. And she was a composer and a musician and quite good. Uh, so, so good, in fact, that Bogarini, uh, who evidently was visiting, uh, devoted his sixth piano sonata to her. Um, she's married, arranged marriage to an aristocrat. She has two married, two daughters, two young daughters, but she's enamored with Ben. And um, she, uh, you know, befriends him and they make music together and they attended concerts and lectures and so on. They even begin to have uh, regular dates. I'll call them dates on, um, on Wednesdays and Saturdays where he would come to her estate and they would be wined and dined and he would visit with her and they'd go for long strolls and many conversations and they played chess together. Yes, sometimes she was in the bathtub, but as was the custom then, there was a plank over her body uh, when they played chess. Uh, her husband knew about the flirtation, but I guess he didn't mind too much. He actually was having an affair with uh, their daughter's um, the governess, but anyway. Madame Brion threw himself at him. There are over a hundred letters we have. She adored him. She called him mon cher papa. She sat on his lap in public, sort of flaunting her intimacy with him to the public. Um, and um, she protested everlasting love. They're wonderful letters. She was sophisticated and, and very intelligent and a wonderful, delicious flirtations. Uh, but when it came to the last favor, she would not grant it to him. He was horrified, he was stunned, he was angry. And he said to her, uh, I may be in my seventies, but there's no reason for me to just restrict myself to you. You want to monopolize me, even though you won't, you, as he put it, she wouldn't feed his cherub, that his cherub was now skinny and lacking in nutrition. Uh, it is one of his many analogies to the fact that she just wouldn't be intimate with him. And so he moved on to another woman, he, he, we can go to the next slide, please. He, of course, enjoyed salons and he enjoyed the salons of pre, pre-revolutionary France with uh, many of the intellectuals, the, uh, the ferment, the discussions. Uh, now this particular woman, Madeleine Vicius, was a widow uh, and lived in a nearby village. Uh, she had been a great beauty at one time, uh, but she was a famous uh, hostess of these salons and that's where he met her. And before long, they began to have a bit of a love affair. Now she was a she was an unusual character. She had sort of after her husband had died, he was the philosopher Claudius Helvetius. She um, she just threw away all convention. So her estate was was very strange. She had aviaries. She did not have a French manicured gardens, a kind of a wild garden with all kinds of unusual plants. She had eighteen cats in the house. Um, that, that had bells and satin ribbons and so on. And she had three single men who lived with her, uh, two abbeys and a medical student. And she was a bit flighty, uh, uh, very social. And it was these three men, at least one of them who acted as her secretary, didn't always work. There are a number of occasions, funny letters from Ben where he said, I washed, I bathed, I preened, I dressed, I made myself as, and we went to your estate for the dinner or the breakfast at various times. And I went there and you were gone. And we were told that you forgot you had a, 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 some kind of a, a, a arrangement or you was had meeting or had these, these flirtations went on and he fell in love with her. Or maybe he didn't fall in love with her. Maybe in his 70s, he thought that he needed to be married again. Maybe he needed a woman to take care of him. But she was really, of course, feminism was not even thought about at the time, but maybe she was one of those because she wanted never to be tied down to another man again. She wanted to live independently. Um, she, Although she told him she loved him, 
Um, and she certainly entertained him lavishly and regularly uh, and even took care of him once when he was sick. Um, but uh, she would not marry him. And he became more and more distressed about that. And he, he, he pushed on that uh, to the point he became almost violent. We know that from letters that uh, her good friend, the economist Turgot wrote, that finally she became so frightened by his ardent proposals and insistence they marry that she fled to Tours for several months until he calmed down. And so later, as it happened with at least two of his other relationships, the one with Catherine Ray and the one with Madame uh, Brion, they become good friends. So um, eventually after the truce with um, Britain, uh, he does go back to America. And it is there that he spends his last years. He's cared for in those last years by Polly, who comes to America and comes with her children and stays in Philadelphia and reads to him. And of course, with Sally, his daughter, who really does the brunt of the, the hard work in the last years of his life. The last slide, please. We know Ben as a man always guided by reason over passion, uh, logic over emotion, uh, and always this is what we think of him. But I believe that if you read the letters and you, you'll see some of them in the book and you think about him a little more and you read about this, this is a man who um, that really um, struggled as many of us will uh, with natural impulses or passions and things and, and reason. Sure, here's one of his famous maxims. If passion drives, let reason hold the reins. But I believe that this is a man who struggled with passion and prudence and didn't always win. Thank you. It's um, been fun to talk to you. I hope you enjoyed the slide lecture. Yeah, the book is out in paperback. You can get it at your local bookstore or online. Um, and, but in any case, I hope that whether you read it or you don't, you will tell other people about it and uh, let them have the fun of enjoying the book. Thank you very much, Jessica. I, I guess we have time for questions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Nancy. That was that was amazing. Thank you so much. Um, I know, um, yeah, you mentioned kind of in your introduction that the, this piece of work was around 25 years in the making because there hadn't been that much yes. interest prior prior to that. Um, so I, I know I, for one, am extremely grateful that you did persevere and see the project through um, because, yeah, these women just had such fascinating stories um, that are certainly certainly worth sharing. So, um, yeah, thank you for thank you for sharing that with us today. Um, so yeah, we now do have time for some questions. Um, so um, if, if you do have any, um, please do send them through using the Q&A function. Um, just one from myself very quickly. Um, I'll just jump in first. Um, I was just wondering if you could kind of tell us um, how you, um, uh, how do you think history would have been different if Deborah and Sally had had, had traveled um, over, over with Ben? Um, I think that's yeah, funny. well, I don't, I, you know, <laughs> I think it would have been different. I mean, I don't know whether he would have stayed in Margaret Stevenson's house at that point, uh, although he did have really run of the whole house and rented many rooms. Um, but who's to say? Um, perhaps they would have uh, stayed there permanently. I don't I don't think the course of the what happened with the pens that that was not going to happen. Um, but, you know, Deborah, perhaps if they decided to stay there long enough, um, Sally might have married William Strahan's son. As it turned out, he the, the son never did marry. Um, so, but when Sally, since Sally was in the in America, she eventually did marry and she had eight children. And in fact, I just got a, a note from one of the descendants saying they have a Franklin reunion coming up in a couple of years. So I mean, I've met other descendants too of the Franklins, but yeah, we don't know. It, it would have been interesting. Would she have become more sophisticated? She was sophisticated in her own way, but would she become more cultured? Would she have, um, would she have enjoyed London? I don't know. And um, do you think, do you think the relationship was also, do you think the relationship between Benjamin and Margaret might have might have altered um, with with Deborah being around? Yes, I think so. And you know that there's one funny letter from Deborah. It's almost like two women who were divorced from the same guy, in which Deborah and in, in which Margaret confides to to uh, Deborah. It's it's an amazing letter, and she says, "Yeah, I think he's been away from you for too long, and you've held on for so long, and I know it's been hard for you." Uh, and she talks about him having a sort of a tantrum over 
Sally's wedding and so on, because Mark, because because Margaret Stevenson was going to send all these uh, and you know stylish English clothes and so on, and 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 he he forbids it. So it's kind of interesting, you know. They they send presents back and forth to each other all the time, but. Um, Deborah sent things like codfish and um, buckwheat and corn and things. And, and Ben kept sending things that some of them Margaret picked out that were clothes and fabrics and teapots and china and tablecloths and so on. So, you know, it's kind of a winking, if you will, or, or maybe just an acceptance of, of this kind of necessary situation, but they both had to cope with it. I don't know, you know, but that's, they, they, they didn't write to each other much. They, neither of them were great on writing, but um, they always sent their polite regards to each other. It's, again, I say sort of a winking or maybe just an acceptance of, of the situation with Ben, with these two families. So, yeah, it is, yeah, it's quite quite a unique situation, that, that's for sure. I, mean, I know at the house, we we uh, that's kind of... Uh, one of the big questions is is how on earth did Deborah put up with <laughs> with what she went through with um with um Margaret and and Polly as well living living in such close quarters. Um, but we do um Debbie, do you have a question? You've got your hand up. Um, if I allow you to to speak, if you want want to voice your question. Yeah. Is she on mute? She's on mute. Yeah. I, I'm sorry. I'm I'm outside and I maybe I pressed something, but I don't have a question, but it's a fascinating discussion. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay, thank you. Sorry, I didn't mean to uh I didn't mean to see that then. <laughs> there we go. Um, yeah, so um, I did actually have a question come through from um, someone earlier who wasn't able to attend the talk. Um, so I'll just ask that as well. Um, so they wanted to know whether whether all the relationships that Ben had were were they were they mainly kind of platonic and flirtatious, um, kind of that was quite typical of an 18th century kind of um, uh, kind of male perspective, I guess. Um, or were they were they genuinely um, serious relationships? Well, a, a lot of a lot of there's no doubt that the 18th century um, mores, and especially by the way in in England and on the continent were this um, uh, delicious uh, flirtation, um, uh, great conversation, wittiness, uh, repartee, um, that was uh, considered the norm. Um, and so indeed, a lot of, a lot of scholars um, and some fairly recently have said, oh, that's all it was. But if you read those letters, at least with the women I've mentioned to you in some depth, they're sincere. There's no question that the the um, and the and the letters that he writes, you know, after uh, his wife dies about um, Margaret Stevenson, they're sincere. He says living with her was among the one of the happiest times in his life. Um, you know, there's just there's no question about it. So it's a little of each. Um, but I think with these women, he was he was for real, and to the point where when when Margaret Stevenson learned that Deborah had died, Dorothy Blunt, who was a friend of Polly's, um, wrote that she was all in a dither because now she expected that Ben was gonna propose and she was gonna become his wife. So, you know, there it is. I mean, it's it's more than just, um, uh, you know, parlor talk um, when, it, when it comes to these women anyway. And he's, he's great at it otherwise, but it's for real. Absolutely, great, thank you. So. Um, so does anyone else have any questions? Um, do you send them through now if you do? Because we've only got about five more minutes left um, before, before we need to finish. Aha, we do have a question. Um, was Sally ever resentful towards her father for leaving her and, her and her mother in America or the treatment that he showed towards Polly? Could you read that again, please? So was Franklin, uh, was Sally ever resentful towards <coughs> her father for leaving her and her mother in America um, or for the treatment that he showed towards Polly? Well, well I think he certainly was, um, yeah, he did, I have to say, he did send her a harpsichord and so on. And when he came back for that short time, they did play music together, him on his harmonica, that's the glass glasses that make different tones. And um, and she on the harpsichord and and Deborah was ecstatic about it, um, but I he certainly she certainly resented 
throughout his, her life, he always was chastising her and saying, you're not being thrifty enough and you have to do this. Even when she had to go to a celebration with uh, George Washington for one of the victories, and she had been a, a great proponent and had helped people to create, to make shirts for the soldiers. She asked for feathers and, you know, from England to decorate her her gown. And he 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 was furious with her at that. Yet he was already involved in a lottery to get Polly, Polly diamond earrings. I don't know whether Sally ever knew that. But clearly, finally, when Polly came over, when Ben was in his last years, uh, we have a few comments that when the two women meet each other, Polly and, and Sally, and there's just um, a lot of tension between them. They're very polite to each other. I mean, good for him. Polly read him and actually wanted him to think about his soul. Uh, but she was more religious, and Sally did the grunt work. Sally was involved with with all of the things to keep an elderly man who was ill, you know, you know, taken care of. Um, so, but we so they had it was a cool relationship, polite, utterly polite and respectable. But of course, she must have resented it greatly. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it always fascinates me how he how he treats Polly and Sally kind of so differently. Um, yeah, really, really interesting. Um, Another question. Yes, we've got. Uh, so, so we just have um, Jane has said thank you very much for helping to bring Franklin to life with so much detail, um, and that she found the talk very, very interesting. Um, and then Amanda has said, um, thank you for a great talk. Um, and she's also asked, will a recording be issued? So um, yes, Amanda, I've talk, um, a recording will be available on our YouTube um, and that'll be with closed captions as well. Um, and that'll be available within within the next week. So um, do do look out for that as well. It'll also be available on our website. So um, check, check there as well. Um, and on Nancy's website, I believe too. <laughs> um, so yeah, any any more questions? One more minute just to submit those if you if you do. Oh, great. Thank you, Amanda. Yeah. OK, well, um, yeah, so um, it is six o'clock now, so we will um, uh, start wrapping up. Um, but if anyone does have any more questions um, at any point, then please do um, get in touch with 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 myself. Um, that's at info at Benjamin Franklin House dot org. Um, and we will be sure to forward on those questions to Nancy, who I'm, I'm sure will also um, be happy to answer those for you, too. Um, but um, yes, we just want to say um, a huge thank you to Nancy for joining us today. Um, I'm sure you'll all agree that that talk was 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 absolutely brilliant. Um, and if you haven't already, I do urge you to read the book because um, there is some there's some real kind of juicy, juicy stuff in there that is kind of 100% uh, <laughs> worth seeing. Um, just to um, just to sum up, basically, um, I just want to alert you to the fact that here at Benjamin Franklin House, um, we do have some more exciting events coming up over the next few months. So please do go on and check our events calendar which is available on our website um, and you can also sign up to our mailing list on there um, and that will enable you to receive quarterly news um, and and be the first to hear about any upcoming programming that we have as well um, but for now I think that is everything let me just oh Joe has just said not a question but thank you all for a great talk so thank you thank you Joe that's that's lovely to hear thank you all for for listening and uh it's been really a privilege to be able to to speak uh at the Ben Franklin house yeah and it's been a privilege to have you as well so um yeah so thank you everyone for tuning in um enjoy the rest of your Friday um and um yeah thank you again Nancy my pleasure right thank you goodbye everyone <laughs>